Good morning. I'd like to welcome you to Broadcast to Post, Key Code Media's series hosting industry professionals discussing audiovisual technology topics that you care about. Today's topic is going to be the classroom of the future, AV innovations for education. I'm your host, Jeff Sengpil, Chief Technologist here at Key Code Media. We're going to keep the intro short today so we can move quickly to our guest interview and demonstrations. We're first joined by Matt Olson, who's the Director of Technical Services at Crestron. Matt will be providing us a look at the essential technology pieces for any modern classroom, including the hardware, wireless, mobile, and administrative pieces. Then we'll be joined by Jacob Barnhart, audiovisual engineer at University of California, Davis. Jacob recently partnered with the Key Code Media Engineering team to remodel four lecture spaces with all new AV technology. Before we get into those interviews, I thought I'd give a quick intro to what we're about to see. So I remember back in the day visiting Disney World and experiencing the Carousel of Progress exhibit. Cool technology that was supposed to happen in the 21st century was shown to kids in the late 70s. Flat panels, HD television, virtual reality video games. Exciting stuff back then, par for the course today. Today we're going to be talking about the classroom of tomorrow. We'll be discussing how fantastic AV technologies can connect together like interactive touch screens, displays, document cameras, smartphones, Zoom video conferences across the globe, live streaming equipment, or even sensors that boot everything up when you've walked in the door. It all turns on by itself. There are literally thousands of products, however, that can do any number of things, but it doesn't mean that it's going to be used by instructors and students. System design for education is never about being bleeding edge. Instead, schools need AV and computer systems that are reliable, have longevity, and require minimal how-to training. Instructors need to be able to enter the room, even at 8 o'clock at night, plug in their presentation without having to have an AV background. Students need to be able to share their examples with the class directly from their laptop or other devices without an instructor having to explain just how to connect to the projector. The classroom has to be a seamless experience whether people are in the lecture hall or watching over a Zoom video conference. So let's dive into the Crestron demo. Quick reminder, if you have any questions throughout this event, shoot them over using the YouTube, Facebook chat, or Vimeo chat that is embedded on our website. So I need my transition music now. First up, we have Matt Olson from Crestron introducing us to their easy to use suite of AV products, connecting instructors, students, and facility into a modern classroom infrastructure. Matt, how are you doing? Thanks, Jeff. Thanks for having us. Uh, why don't we go ahead and jump right into the DMPS and DMPS Lite? So let's take a conference room that has a single display and multiple connection points. The customer can select the right transmitter for the application. So if there's a podium in the front of the room, we can mount the transmitter directly into the front of the wall, or select another transmitter to mount underneath the table. Now, if a customer wants to have both a hybrid, wired, and wireless experience, they can simply pair that with an AM200, Crestron's Air Media Solution. With that, the customer can select whether they want to plug their laptop in directly with an HDMI cable or a USB-C converter cable, or present wirelessly in the front of the room. In addition, we can connect a speaker and a microphone directly to the DMPS light receiver to provide an extensible audio experience. Lastly, if we want to pair additional control options, we can simply add an occupancy sensor, a touch panel, and a Crestron control system running AV framework to bring the entire solution together with no programming and a full out-of-the-box experience. Effectively, all we need to do is press the correct label on the touch panel to switch to the right source. Customers can also disconnect the laptop from the table and automatically route using the device's auto route feature. In today's environment, a touch-free meeting experience is crucial. By adding the occupancy sensor, you can ensure that the room turns on as soon as someone walks into the room. And then after the meeting is over, the system automatically shuts down. From the simplest source to display or multi-source to display, the DM Lite and DMPS Lite product lines have you covered. Cool. So very cool features there. So um, let's get started with the hardware. 
there appears to be quite a few products between DMPS, DM Light. Can you give a high level overview of the DMPS family of products? Yeah, sure. So DMPS has been around for some time now, uh, and it's based on our digital media uh, product. And it actually is an evolution from our media presentation system back in the analog days. Um, the DM Light product family is newer uh, to the market, and that really covers the, the core functionality of just getting video from point A to point B, uh, where distance isn't really something where I need to go across campus. It's, it's mostly an in-room solution. Uh, the biggest difference between DMPS and DMPS Light is that DMPS integrates a processor right on board. So full AV framework functionality right out of the box, or if uh, a certain system needs custom programming, it can certainly be accommodated there. Whereas DMPS Lite does have some core functionality built right on board out of the box. Turn the system on when sync is detect, turn it off when people leave the room. Um, but if you need a, a more robust uh, set of customization, uh, you can certainly augment that with a small outboard processor, an on-wall processor like an MPC3 uh, to bring full AV framework capabilities. And beyond that, if you need fully custom, you can certainly facilitate that as well with an outboard processor. So it really is a good, better, best type of, of scenario. Uh, and really trying to be price optimized for the solution that's actually needed for the space. Very cool. One of the things I saw there was the automatic routing. So you can have a, a computer plugged in HDMI and then disconnect and wander around with that device, or can you also change from one device to another automatically? Yeah, so uh, all of those product families, whether it's the DMPS or the DMPS Lite, or even some of our smaller, uh, just simple HDMI switchers, uh, feature auto routing whereby if someone's plugged in, uh, you got a source plugged into one of the inputs and someone comes and plugs into a wall plate, for instance, it'll route to that wall plate. And the neat thing is they also auto unroute. So as people disconnect sources, they'll go back to the last known good source, uh, which is a really key feature. Uh, you mentioned walking around and, and that's gonna leverage uh, some of our air media technologies, which we'll probably talk about a little bit later. Well, certainly. Um, so. In looking at the, the feature list, the, the DMPS 3, 4K, 350, and the 250 both feature that built-in air media wireless presentation, three independent LAN ports, network control, and content, and then you've got a 50-watt amplifier and on-screen display. So what are the, gonna, the basic requirements going to be for a classroom to get their system up and running? Cable, bandwidth, and that sort of stuff. Yeah, so you mentioned those three uh, network ports, and it sounds like, gosh, I'm going to need uh, three network drops. But no, the, the, the whole point of those three network drops is to avoid additional network drops. Um, it's, it's all about choices and flexibility. So you can put everything on the same LAN connector if you've got a flat network. That's just fine. But we also give you the option of the control subnet where we create our own little world in the classroom uh, that doesn't need to touch the, the campus network. So I can, I can augment the size of the system, built-in router, firewall, all those features. So it's air gapped from the campus network, uh, but still you can talk to all that stuff in the room to the processor. And the processor can also talk to the building network via the LAN port. We also add that content LAN uh, if you wanted to create a separate network for either streaming media or air media wireless presentation. Again, it's all options. You can assign any of those functions to any of those ports. Um, but the, the whole point here is to get your whole classroom done with the, with the one drop that probably already exists. So you had talked about connecting microphones and speakers. We, we actually have a Shure ceiling microphone here at Keycode in Burbank. Uh, can you talk about some of the external microphone and speaker products that Crestron will connect well with? Yeah, certainly. So in the, in the DMPS and DMPS Lite product family, we're looking at uh, line level inputs and mic level inputs and outputs. Uh, we do also have a number of other, pro other products coming to the market that feature AES-67 uh, to transport um, digital audio around a network uh, seamlessly without a, a number of external connections. Very cool. So can you talk a little bit about what you mean by no programming required? What's that going to mean for the customer? And what's that going to mean for me who is thinking about taking Crestron pro programming classes? Sure. So it, it really is a, a two-ended proposition. Um, from the start, you don't need a programmer or a specific skill set uh, for programmers to deploy the system from the get-go. Uh, it's all web-based configuration, right from a laptop or even an iPad, uh, you can configure these systems. And once you've configured the first room, you can simply copy that configuration to all subsequent rooms. Um, that's obviously gonna mean a, a lower cost of deployment initially. Longer term, 
you know, one of the things that has challenged uh, campuses, especially those with limited staff is, gosh, I changed Blu-ray player A to Blu-ray uh, player B. Uh, how do I get control of that? And, you know, long, long ago in the, in the long ancient history of, of uh, AV world, you know, five, 10 years ago, that would have required getting a programmer out, rolling a truck, um, writing new code, deploying it to all of those systems. Uh, these days, it really is just going into the web-based configuration, changing Blu-ray player A to Blu-ray player B, and clicking go. Um, we have an online database of over 5,000 drivers uh, to control various sources and displays. So the days of requiring uh, a custom programmer, um, both the time involved and the skill set involved and the, and the cost involved, um, are, are really over. And, and as we get into XIO Cloud towards the end of this, um, deploying those changes, it just got a whole lot easier as well. Sounds almost as easy as, you know, dealing with your home smart TV. It just suddenly works. And anything, anytime you can cut and paste between rooms and then just exit and you're done, that, that sounds like a wonderful thing for customers. Exactly. Hey, everyone. Delix Alex here, Senior Product Manager for Crestron's Enterprise Applications, here to talk to you about our Air Media 2.0 wireless presentation line. Crestron's Air Media line uh, offers various functionality in different form factors. And today here, we're looking at the AM-300 Air Media wireless presentation system. Air Media enables simple and easy to use wireless presentation from almost any device, iOS, Mac, Android, Chrome OS, and even more. Air Media effectively allows users to collaborate in conference rooms, huddle spaces, classroom environments, and more. With Air Media Wireless Presentation, a touchless experience into your room is a breeze. Simply walk into the room, open your personal device, and enter the Air Media address and passcode displayed on the screen, and immediately you are connected. With Air Media's low latency and smooth, high-quality video, users get a wired experience, but on a wireless platform. Air Media also works with your IT department and IT infrastructure to work with it and not against it. Like all Crestron products, Air Media works with the latest and greatest security technologies like AES 802.1x and much more. With Crestron's XIO Cloud coupled with the Air Media platform, management is a breeze, giving you the ability to control almost any aspect of the system remotely from anywhere in the world. And today we are excited to announce a new feature set in the platform called Air Media Canvas. With Air Media Canvas mode, the platform enables devices of differing aspect ratios, orientations, and resolutions to simultaneously present content on the screen for the optimal viewing experience. So imagine a second user with an iPad comes in to share. Simply swipe, connect, and select my Air Media receiver and the content is immediately on the screen. As you can notice, my iPad with a portrait orientation is side by side with my Windows device in a landscape orientation, showing you the capability of Air Media Canvas to best fit the content on the screen. With Air Media Canvas, it's not just about two users presenting on the screen. With Air Media Canvas control available via a Crestron touch panel interface, you can manage several users right from an elegant, easy to use interface. For example, if a teacher wants to moderate a session of students presenting from the Canvas control interface, you can queue up your users so they're presenting and collaborating effectively. All in all, Crestron's Air Media platform gives you the ability to deploy touchless room experiences. So there's been a lot of developments in Air Media. What's been new lately? Uh, what are the updates? Yeah, so a lot of exciting updates to Air Media. Uh, and the neat thing about Crestron Hardware is we're about, uh, uh, able to add new features over time. And some of the recent additions are the ability to uh, bring in Miracast sources. So a lot of those Windows 10 PCs have that built right in. Uh, so it's a simple uh, Windows P and, and select the uh, device and away you go. Similar to how it works on a Mac device with AirPlay no third party or additional uh, software is needed. It just leverages the capabilities built right into the platform. Uh, one of the other new features, in addition to the Canvas control we just talked about, is the ability to pair Air Media directly with an occupancy sensor, one of our 
uh, network-based occupancy sensors. And this allows things to just uh, utilize background automation. User walks into the room, occupancy sensor detects your presence, tells the Air Media, hey, someone's here. Air Media, using its onboard control, is able to wake up the display, select the correct input, and display connections on the screen of how to uh, start presenting. So the whole idea here is to minimize friction and, and wondering how the technology works, and so you can start working a little more quickly. How many sources can Air Media Canvas handle today? How would you use this in a classroom or lecture hall or, you know, in, in both? Yeah, sure. So uh, right now today, and I imagine this might be the case uh, for the foreseeable future, um, it supports two sources on screen at a time. And, you know, when we did some market research on this, uh, you know, do we need two? Do we need four? You know, what is the, what is the magic number? And, and what we found is that um, you know, people are generally using one, right? That's, that's the dominant use case is, is showing one source on the screen at the same time. Um, but even in, in active learning spaces where you need to see multiple sources on the screen at one time, it seemed like the magic number based on our research was, was two. And that was based on legibility, right? You can actually see what's on the screen. If you start squeezing too many things on, on a screen at one time, it's it's a thumbnail at that point, right? It's not really something that's actually usable. It's a, it's a preview monitor and not really actually a presentation monitor. So that's why we went with two. Makes sense. Otherwise, everyone's going to need you know glasses. Um, so can you could an educator control the room from their mobile device, or do they have to do that from a laptop or another Air Media enabled device? Great question. It's all about options. So they can do it right from their mobile device, um, right within the Air Media application. They'll be able to, uh, you know, determine who is presenting, uh, present content themselves directly from that device as well. Very cool. Um, I was actually just out in Chicago and saw my sister teaching from home. Do you have any document scanners like Wolf Vision that can connect through Air Media? Uh, you can certainly use that external HDMI input as a source right into the same box. So uh, ultimately, the Air Media appliance is a single source to the system, right? Uh, and whether that comes from an external document camera or a laptop or wireless presentation via iOS or Windows 10 Miracast, uh, we don't care. Um, so any of those any of those inputs, whether wireless or wired, become the one singular output to uh, the the presentation. Very cool. I think we need to get into the mobile stuff now. Sounds great. Hi. I'm Mark Slavosky, Senior Product Manager in the Digital Workplace here at Crestron. I'm here to talk to you about mobile room control from your personal device. When we think about mobile room control from the personal device, there are several key challenges that you're faced with. We think about this as four key hurdles. Number one, AV room controls are often, if not always, on different networks in the corporate or your mobile device network. Crestron is solving this by using Bluetooth in the mobile device and the touchscreen that creates a peer-to-peer -peer connection. Because of how the mobile device communicates directly with the touchscreen, you avoid having the mobile device that we're not expected to be on any other network is specifically a personal mobile device connected to the touchscreen and not on the AV network. Two, User interfaces are generally designed for large in-room touchscreens and not optimized for the mobile phone. Crestron also solves this by providing a mobile-friendly user interface that is data-driven by which the controls that you, the AV or IT administrator, select to appear on the mobile device. Three, if it's not easy for the individual to control the room, no one's going to use it. Crestron solves this. It's as easy as opening the app, connecting to the room, authenticating to the room, and controlling the room. And four, must be a simple solution for the administrator to enable the room control within the corporate environment. Crestrun solves this by not requiring reprogramming of your existing system, no changes to the control system program or the user interface on the touchscreen. This works with 60 series touchscreens and three series and four series control processors. And new firmware is required to have this new capability. That's the only thing that you need to update. We've also designed for scalability. Setting up one room is as easy as setting up 10, 50, or 100 rooms. You can use the same configuration file across all of the rooms, so long as the configuration file has the same type of controls for room to room. I mentioned that the solution needs to be easy 
for the individual, and it's just that simple. There you have it. As simple as one, connect, two, authenticate, and three, control. Your Crestron smart room just got smarter with mobile device room control. So I spent the 90s sitting behind executives making sure that their conference room worked correctly. So I, I really get this whole, it's got to be easy or it can't be used. So when you look at Crestron One is, uh, as an app, is it just an app on Android or iOS? Or is it a browser-based login? And is it free? Great questions. Uh, Crestron One right now is an iOS uh, application uh, supported on iOS uh, 12 or later. Um, it is free to the end user. So that's one of the great things uh, about this migration to um, a solution like Crestron One. There's no in-app purchases. There's no licensing uh, at the user end of things. Uh, any licensing happens on the processor. So yes, there is a license involved. Uh, it is very nominal and supports a number of features in addition to Crestron One. Um, but to the end user, it's as simple as uh, downloading the free application and a Bluetooth is enabled on their phone, which 99% of the time it is, uh, they can just walk into the room and it works. Very cool. So there appears to be a Crestron Mobile and a Crestron One. Can you go over what the differences are between those two? Certainly. Yeah, Crestron One was uh, our answer to uh, what the market asked of us uh, in the recent months, uh, given what's going on in the world. And that is, how do I enable a touch-free environment um, for my systems, right? Um, so Crestron One answered that, that, that question um, by putting the power of the room control right in the palm of the hands of uh, folks, anyone who walks into the room to use it, right? Uh, no pre-deploying UIs, no setting up connection to processors. Uh, so it's meant to be a, an easy, frictionless, mobile-first UI uh, that anyone can use and be intuitive. Crestron Mobile or Mobile Pro, on the other hand, uh, those are fully customized uh, user applications, right? So if you want to use an iPad to be everything that you have on a touch screen, um, when you need that much real estate for that many uh, granular controls, right? Uh, whereas the, the Crestron One user interface is, is intended to be a very simple, anyone can use, um, Rhonda from accounting, you know, Mark from marketing, you know, whoever walks into the room to use it, they can easily see the most pertinent controls and immediately control the room. The easier the better. So let's, let's get into a little bit about uh, Crestron Flex. At Crestron, we've been watching this trend of online learning programs very closely. Many schools have been adding capabilities for students to have virtual experiences, and our Flex series is an amazing solution which can support a Zoom platform, Microsoft Teams, or any other UC-based software to create a synchronous learning environment for your remote students. From the Tabletop Flex M series to the installed configuration, the C series, and the rapid deployment R series system, Flex offers a variety of ways to bring UC to your campus no matter what scenario you require. There are institutions that are choosing to mount the Crestron Flex MX units into their lecterns. The MX have built-in mic and AEC to allow the instructor to speak in a normal voice. They then add the camera showing the front of the classroom and the whiteboard, which is transmitted into the MX system to be shared via Teams or Zoom. We have some terrific resources for hybrid learning spaces and mobile solutions listed on our education market page on Crestron.com. These include some application diagrams for adding Zoom capabilities to a new space or an existing classroom. Does Crestron Flex come with out-of-the-box support for Zoom and Teams? It does. It yeah, does. we have different yeah. kits uh, designed for the different platforms. Uh, so we have uh, models that are designed specifically for Teams, and we have models that are designed specifically for, for Zoom. Uh, and these will be Teams rooms or Zoom rooms out of the box. And on our advanced kits, you know, if, uh, if a campus is struggling to make a platform decision, because it is a big decision, if we're going to invest all in Teams or all in Zoom, for example, uh, on our advanced kits, we actually offer the flexibility that if a decision changes down the road, um, administratively, these products can be flipped into the other platforms, so we don't have to reinvest in a bunch of hardware. That sounds like a very smart way to do it. So, um, how does Flex make joining, sharing content, and moderating Zoom or Teams meetings easier? Couldn't I just do that from a laptop? Uh, you can just do it from a laptop, uh, and you can certainly also do it from a laptop in addition to using uh, the Teams rooms or the Zoom rooms console. Uh, the, the reason it makes it easier is the room is ready for you. So once the room is scheduled, 
uh, and invited to the meeting, it's got a join now button right there on the user interface. So you know, uh, in, the, in the classroom paradigm, a teacher walks in, they see their meeting is, uh, their class is scheduled, they click join, they're done. Uh, now they can use their laptop for presenting content and not having to worry about jockeying windows around, um, you know, to, to share the right thing. Now you've got a dedicated interface to run your meeting and a dedicated interface to run your presentation content. Uh, so let's get into a little bit of cloud. Xero Cloud is a cloud-based device management and monitoring platform. A core part of it in being a cloud-based system is that it can let you monitor, manage, and support your AV technology from anywhere. This is particularly important right now as we return to the office in the era of COVID-19, when support functions that may have previously been done in person need to be done remotely. It's no secret that the Healthy IQ camera included with Crestron Flex Systems is a great camera. One of the best things about it is that, beyond just great optics, it includes a built-in AI engine for doing advanced analytics of the space. The first way we are taking advantage of this is through people counting allowing you to know how many people are in the space without any additional hardware. Because the processing is all done directly on the camera without sending the images outside the room and is not based on recognizing individual faces, it's a privacy safe way for getting more information about how your rooms are used. When a flex system is claimed into Exile Cloud with a Hudley camera attached to it, details about the camera can be found on the status tab for the UC engine component of the system. As you can see here, one of those details is the count of people in the room. This will update once every minute, allowing you to check how many people are in the room at any time. Of course, we want to be able to do something with that data instead of just look at it. To start, we can enter a maximum capacity for the room. This way we'll know if the room is within its capacity, whether that is a standard capacity or reduced capacity to support socially distanced meeting. To enter the capacity, we'll go to this device metadata tab. Especially right now, we're going to want to know when a room is exceeding its capacity so that we can do something about it. We can navigate to the alerts configuration page on XAO Cloud and add an alert if a room exceeds its capacity. This way we'll get a text message or email when there are too many people in the room. And I've received an alert telling me that too many people are in the space. Now I can go and make sure that some of the people in the room go someplace else in order to keep everybody safe. Of course, there's more to monitoring an entire AV estate than just responding to immediate needs. It's important to understand adherence to capacity rules for all rooms especially as you adjust messaging to encourage compliance. Exo Cloud gathers the people counting information to present in the form of interactive dashboards, showing you capacity adherence rates across rooms, as well as how that adherence changes over time. You can filter the dashboard to concentrate on particular rooms, dates, or hours during the day. As you can see, with this feature, you can leverage the investments you have already made in workplace technology to make your meetings safer. Sometimes, you just need to help out the people in the room. Maybe they're trying to start a Teams call and are not comfortable with the interface, Maybe they're just not quite sure how to use the custom UI on the touch screen to get their laptop onto the display in the room. Or maybe there actually is a problem in the room that needs to be diagnosed by seeing it. Of course, when somebody's in the middle of a meeting, rushing over to where they are is going to waste precious meeting time. Plus, we want to limit the number of people in contact with each other anyway. For that, XIO Cloud supports full remote control of touch screens, including the TSW 560, 760, 1060, TSS 7, and TSS 10, and Mercury. With this service, you can view exactly what is on the screen in the room. This could be anything on the screen, custom code, the built-in scheduling functionality, or third-party applications like Microsoft Teams, Zoom, or one of our scheduling partners. Beyond just seeing what's on the screen, you can actually take control of the screen, just like if you're in the room tapping on it yourself. It really is just like a virtual touch on the touch screen. The screen in the room will respond as you use it. So what is Crestron XIO Cloud? That's a big question. Uh, it does a lot uh, from uh, pre-deployment to deployment to managing and monitoring to analytics to informing future technology purposes uh, purchases. Uh, the from the deployment side of things, uh, we can claim devices into Exile Cloud before they're actually even out of the box and live. Uh, that allows us to bring them into the portal. It presents the user interface for configuring that device. So we can pre-configure devices by the tens, dozens, hundreds, thousands uh, before they even show up on site. When they come out of the box and plug in, uh, they reach up to XIO Cloud and XIO Cloud says, hey, I'm glad you're here. Here are your settings. Now that they're in XIO Cloud, we can uh, continue to monitor and manage their status. Um, if we need to make a configuration change, it's, it's as easy to make a configuration change on one device as it is a thousand devices. It's the same number of clicks. Um, and in terms of monitoring, we can get alerts on outages. We can, uh, we can see trends over time. Uh, since all of these devices are, are constantly reporting status changes up to XIO Cloud, as things change, 
Um, we have a treasure trove of data to understand how these rooms are being used. That translates into analytics, which translates into information that both IT professionals, AV professionals, and real estate professionals can use to plan both technology purchase decisions or real estate planning decisions in the future. So really is, you know, covers the entire life cycle uh, of any given technology space. So that, that sounds great for all the Crestron devices. What if you've got non-Crestron devices and what's the interactivity with those? That's a really great question. You know, we obviously want to be um, a very purposeful and useful uh, tool for folks to manage their facilities. Uh, and, and being able to monitor the Crestron devices is great, but what about the display at the front of the room? That's probably the next biggest piece of technology in this space that folks might want to manage and monitor. Uh, good news there. So we've got a couple of different things on the imminent horizon. Uh, one of them is an SDK for third-party display manufacturers that we're going to start seeing here probably within the month. Uh, that will allow those devices to connect directly to XIO Cloud uh, and appear as a native device in XIO Cloud. So now we're expanding that single pane of glass beyond Crestron devices into the other technology in the room. Shortly after the uh, first of the year uh, into 2021, we're going to support um, all of those 5,000 devices that we talked about earlier in the, in the uh, online driver portal. Uh, if we use those drivers to control those devices, we'll be able to virtually ingest those devices into XIO Cloud as well. So now we really can have a holistic vision on all the technology in the space. And having you know one single pane of class for anything is it makes it a lot easier for management and control. Matt, thanks for taking the time to do, go over these with us and uh, we'll have you back for the Q&A in just a little bit. Absolutely, my pleasure. All right, now we're going to talk with Jacob Barnhart, audiovisual engineer at UC Davis. He's had a front row seat to see how the Davis team goes about selecting and installing AV systems across the entire campus. He's going to speak with us today about their recent renovations at Young Hall, as well as how the campus is managing upgrades during these COVID times. All right, we got Jacob Bernhardt from UC Davis joining us from uh, his new classrooms of the future. Jacob, can you tell us a little bit about what you do at UC Davis? Sure. I am an AV engineer here at UC Davis. I uh, am a, one of three engineers that we have. Uh, we design all of our general assignment classrooms and provide uh, tier three repair services. Very cool. So can we talk a little bit about the recent renovations you guys did at Young Hall? Uh, what led the school to determining this hall needed renovation? Sure. So we have a construction management team, design and construction management, and they look at, uh, they get money from the registrar to renovate these classrooms. And they select which classrooms need renovation based on the age, the use, the building longevity, and um, <clears throat> kind of like what rooms the uh, registrar needs in terms of classroom size. Um, for example, we have a handful of rooms that are on a do not resuscitate list because the building is very old. Um, this building is old, but it's not planned to be decommissioned anytime soon. I'm talking specifically about Young Hall, um, and it's a heavily used room. Uh, one of the other challenges we have uh, prior to COVID, obviously, was these rooms are in such heavy use that we get a very short window to get in there and actually renovate them. So we have about 136 general assignment classrooms. We're building a few more buildings currently, so that room's going to go up. And these are the, the types of rooms that we are um, in charge of general assignments this is undergraduate classrooms. And the registrar selected four rooms in Young Hall, one of which is a large lecture hall, holds about 300 people, and it is under heavy, heavy use for uh, hard sciences, undergraduate hard sciences. So that was the largest room they selected. And then there's three other rooms adjacent to them, uh, to that room. One is medium, a uh, little less than 100, and the other are what we would consider small classrooms, which is um, 15 to 35 or 40. Um, rooms. And so these rooms haven't really been touched um, for a long time. The building was built in the 60s and a lot of the acoustic treatment and the ceiling and the air conditioning systems, all, the, all that stuff was original. It had a couple AV refreshes, but 
because they didn't tear everything else down. We're talking latched Panduit on top of latched Panduit and just band-aids everywhere. So this was a complete renovate, gut the walls, new ceilings, new chairs, new furniture, new floors, everything. So um, we did 16 rooms this summer. We did four in Young Hall and we did 12 in Wellman. The four in Young Hall are larger and required a little bit more um, uh, high touch than the other project we did. Very cool. So with that many spaces, you've got to get a lot of planning out of the way. How did you go about planning the redesign and selecting the vendors? Can you describe how the bid process went? Sure. So our, um, our, our hit the ground running date is when spring uh, quarter finishes, which is uh, early, early June. And so we start designing a select, we try to get what rooms we're going to do way back in um, December. Uh, and then we start designing um, what displays we're going to use in that room. We have a, a core architecture that we um, use in most of the GAC spaces. Then we deviate from it depending on the size of the room, maybe gets a different sound system. Um, but most of the gear uh, is pretty similar room to room. Obviously, things like the desk size and the projection screens and that sort of thing are a little different. So we um, put together drawing packages and parts lists. And then there are, well, this wasn't a formal bid because we have a, U, the UCOP has a contract with four contractors that we're allowed to select from and key code is one of them. So we put together our design packages for both buildings and we got proposals from all four, uh, all four contractors. And um, our, our decisions were selected by price, our relationship with that contractor, that contractor's track record, and how involved they were in the design process. How communicative were they? How much back and forth do we have? And how, how involved were they in the design process? Very cool. So in that design process, you're making technology decisions. So what tech projectors and systems were included in that final design and why? So for projection um, uh, devices, we use uh, Panasonic lasers. Uh, for flat screens, we typically in these uh, medium-sized rooms use 86-inch NEC um, commercial displays. And if we need smaller stuff, we usually go with Samsung uh, commercial um, digital signage displays. Um, and the reason we do that is most of our decisions are based off of reliability and longevity. We don't want to be on the cutting or bleeding edge of technology because once these rooms are in use, they're in use from 7 a.m. until 10 p.m., uh, six to seven days a week. And there's no real time for us to get in there to fix anything if we have a failure um, besides after hours or on sometimes on weekends. So we really are um, taking a long-term approach in the support of these rooms. And so we don't go out and buy the brand new whiz bang thing with fun features that aren't fully vetted. And we have a test lab where we'll buy stuff and test it thoroughly and vet it and make sure that we, if there are failure modes, we know what they are. We know how to support it before we go and deploy a whole bunch of these systems. So um, we recently made the, a couple of years ago, we made the change to um, laser phosphor uh, projectors because our repair team no longer has to run around and do bulbs, but we weren't, jumping on the laser um, bandwagon the second they came out we waited you know for them to be true tried and true and we we've had good luck with uh, Panasonic. Very cool so it sounds like there were some key decisions there that um, led to implementation success do you think there were any other decisions that were in that process that led to a very successful project for you guys? <clears throat> Uh, yeah, so we have um, experience with our design team, uh, the, the architects that work on stuff. And uh, from our experience, we know that they sometimes change their mind uh, about things like the ceiling height at the last minute. So we've um, gone ahead and kind of standardized on some flexible uh, solutions. So uh, things like adjustable pole mounts for the projectors and the TV. So if they change the ceiling height, we can... Uh, accommodate that. And for almost all overhead support, we try to put 
larger pieces of Unistrut in than what you would typically see. That way we have a lot of flexibility to move things around. Um, if they decide they want the screen bigger and then we have to relocate the projector or so forth. And um, also some of these buildings have um, some overhead uh, issues like um, we have uh, a, one building that has honeycombed ceiling concrete that was really popular in the 60s for acoustic reasons, but that gives you a very small amount of real estate to put uh, concrete anchors in the ceiling. So having longer um, pieces of strut give you the ability to uh, tag it in multiple places. Uh, the good thing about our standardized uh, classroom systems moving forward uh, is all, everything we did in this classroom matches the other lecture halls we've done. So the instructor experience is pretty seamless going from room to room, which is kind of what we're going for. The uh, GUI and the look and feel of the room is almost identical to everything else. One change we did have uh, this summer is we selected a different instructor's desk. We've been getting a lot of requests to have a smaller desk in the smaller spaces that is not as deep. And so the um, architect can fit more seating in that room. Uh, and so we have, um, for the many years gone with a middle Atlantic, uh, sit stand and we now, uh, are trying out a spectrum, uh, industries, um, piece of furniture. And so besides the desk change, all the other equipment is identical. The dot cams identical, the confidence monitors identical, the input and outputs are the same. Uh, the touch panel and the GUI is the same. However, the code base behind the, uh, touch panel and uh, all of the um, Crestron code is uh, brand new, but um, on the front end, it's identical. Awesome. I mean, it's always great when you can cut and paste uh, any config, and our friends from Crestron were talking about that just a little while ago, and doing that in the design process, that just makes that whole, whole part go simpler. How are you using Crestron there at UC Davis? So we've standardized on um, a while ago now, I think five, six years ago on uh, HDBase-T. We're using DM um, matrices in all of our classrooms. We're using eight by eights in our classrooms and in most of our lecture halls, we have 16 bys because we have uh, more um, outputs. And uh, we have CP3Ns in all the rooms and um, 10 inch uh, touch panels. And so we're, we're pretty much a, we're a pretty heavy user of Crestron on campus. We have uh, an on-prem uh, fusion server that our tier one support team can uh, monitor and do uh, calls, uh, uh, see, uh, service calls um, from any device. They can control the rooms. Um, our lecture capture team uses fusion to remotely um, change their audio feeds. So we have a discrete uh, feed for all their lecture equipment and they can um, make modifications to uh, volume adjustments without affecting anything in the room. And they can do this all remotely from um, their studio. Um, so yeah, we are, we have one room with NVX uh, in it and we had some on-campus challenges with our uh, network operations center. Um, we're still exploring uh, AV over IP solutions, but unfortunately, our, uh, our our data center works uh, even slower than we do and even more securely than we do. So again, we're not on the bleeding edge of technology in any regard. There's always challenges with, with any install. Now, given that it's 2020, um, how did the challenge of COVID impact your timeline and the installation process? So yeah, this, this happened kind of right when we were starting uh, our installation, um, we, Everyone on campus uh, that could um, was sent home to work from home. Um, engineers that had critical on-campus things or support teams, uh, we had a relaxed uh, or reduced on-campus presence. So we're here, I'm here today, uh, one day a week, and I kind of alternate with my colleagues on who's covering. Uh, obviously, if there's an emergency, we'd come in right away. Um, when the construction started, we had just kind of surveys for everyone coming on campus. Um, the restrictions for on-campus presence got um, a lot more heavy-handed after um, uh, Key Code finished. We now have um, testing weekly if you're on campus and a daily survey um, if you come to campus. But um, actually, the uh, 
COVID um, impacted this job site in an interesting way because the classes that were planned on happening in these rooms were all canceled. So the uh, handover date of occupancy kind of slid to whatever is convenient for people because no one was going to be really using the room. There, for a second, we thought we they were going to have some emergency overflow stuff in the rooms, but then the uh, campus decided that we're not going to have any in-person uh, classes, at least for that fall quarter. Um, so our deadlines did slide a little bit. And that presented some other challenges because other trades um, – took their time on things, which, you know, trickle down to everybody having to kind of work around that. So there was some logistical scheduling stuff. Um, one of the main factors that COVID uh, really hit us was we were really concerned about uh, supply chain on getting the inventory of the electronics. Uh, a lot of stuff was back ordered. A lot of stuff was not uh, accessible or um, uh, manufacturing um, was impacted. So we really pushed hard once we got once we selected uh, our contractors to get all the equipment purchased and ordered as soon as possible um, because the second COVID hit all of the other campuses started doing uh, hybridized or, or remote um, classes and things like webcams you you know everything was uh, completely back ordered so we did really push hard to try and get all of our equipment in on time and almost all of it came in on time we had a couple straggling things here and there but it, it all worked out. So, Jacob, thanks for taking the time today to sit down and talk with us about your experiences. And I uh, hope you guys have a great school year and we can all get back into these rooms that are waiting for everybody as quickly as we can. Yeah, we're all looking forward to getting back to normalcy and seeing the campus full of students. Uh, until then, we're just kind of making things happen. Awesome sauce. Thanks again and uh, have, a great, have a great rest of the day. Okay, you too. Thank you. Thank you.